Welcome to Elevating Consciousness, the podcast that helps you discover deeper levels of truth, meaning, and wholeness. I'm your host, Artem Zen, and today's guest is the author of Precognitive Dream Work and The Long Self, a mind-expanding book that will challenge your ideas about dreams, time, and reality. He holds a PhD in anthropology from Emory University and works as a professional science writer. In his spare time, he writes about science fiction, consciousness, and the paranormal on his popular blog, The Night Shirt. Eric Wargo, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, so I'm fascinated with dreams and, and how they work and what they potentially can mean. Over the years, I've definitely started to write down some of my dreams, and I've even tried to analyze some of them, although I don't think I've had much success in terms of deciphering what they actually mean. And recently, I read your book, Precognitive Dream Work and the Long Self, and it's really re-sparked my interest in dreams and helped me to gain a different understanding of how dreams potentially work. I'm really curious to start off, how did you get into studying dreams and uh, doing the work that you're doing now? Yeah, it's a long story. Uh, I, I've been interested in dreams my whole life. Um, one of the books that I mention in the new book, uh, Precognitive Dream Work and the Long Self, is an uh, is a book from like I think 1974 by Anne Faraday called The Dream Game and this was a uh, paperback that my dad had on he was a psychologist um, and he had it on his bookshelf and I read it when I was in my teens I guess and it's just like this is mind-blowing to me and uh, so I'd I've always paid attention to my dreams and at that I didn't start actually keeping a dream journal until uh, probably when I was in my 20s um, but then in graduate school, uh, psychoanalysis was a kind of big part of the theoretical framework of what I was studying in anthropology. Um, so I read a lot of Freud and Lacan and so on. And, and somewhere around in, in the mid nineties, I started keeping a, 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 a real dream journal and doing it electronically on a word processor. And, uh, and yeah, and the more you record your dreams and the more in the more detail that you put into your recording, like for me, it's a lot easier to type something out because I'm a fast typist, but I'm a, my handwriting is illegible, you know, so, uh, so, you know, I, I could, I could like write a whole page of details about a dream. And then the more you do that, the more detailed your dreams become and, and the more, or at least the more you remember them, you know, uh, so I, you know, I, started keeping a very detailed uh, electronic dream journal um, and thinking about them in psychoanalytic terms mainly. And then in the late nineties, I gravitated to Jung and, you know, read a lot of Jung and as a lot of people do. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like there, there are a lot of uh, brilliant thinkers of the past century who've, you know, really opened up different aspects of the dream world. And uh, if you keep a dream record, it's just, it's just an amazing, you know, it's an amazing thing. It just opens up so many doors to, you know, yourself. <laughs> um, I didn't think in terms of dream precognition, I mean, that was not a topic that I was even aware of. And I, actually as the child of psychologists who tend to be very skeptical about things like ESP, it just wasn't even part of my worldview that that was possible. But um, I, in the late, uh, let's see, around 2009, I started reading uh, a lot in the UFO literature, actually for a different reason. I actually had a UFO sighting. I started reading about UFOs. And, and the thing is, you know, you, you get very far down the rabbit hole of UFOs, you realize that this is a topic that dovetails with psychic phenomena. And I, you know, had no problem, you know, as a materialist, you know, with UFOs, but I really, I had a problem with psychic phenomena, but I realized smart people were taking psychic phenomena seriously. And, oh, there was this whole, you know, huge research program and, uh, you know, funded by the CIA and remote viewing and stuff like that. Like, wow, this was totally uh, eye-opening to me. And it forced me to sort of do my due diligence in reading about the topic. Uh, and in 2011, a major study was published by uh, a Cornell 
a very eminent Cornell psychologist named Daryl Bem, who did this amazing series of research. Now this was on dreams, but what he did was he, he reversed the, uh, the temporal sequence of stimulus and response in some very common psychology sort of standard uh, mo um, paradigms uh, for testing things like priming and memory and so forth. But he, he, but he, what he did was reverse the stimulus and response. So he would test, he would have some sort of test uh, where undergraduates in the lab were supposed to make some kind of response in a test. And then he'd have the stimulus that was supposed to influence their response afterwards. Okay. And he got significant results on this. All right. And so this was really scandalous because, you know, for, you know, a long time, there have been studies like this published in parapsychology journals that nobody reads, but this was published in one of the major psychology journals. Um, and, uh, and man, it caused a firestorm really of, of, of anger actually from psychologists, but it, it, you know, got him on the Colbert report. Uh, it really made a splash uh, in the public with this incredible finding. And it wasn't like some little study of four people, you know, this was, you know, each of his, each of his experiments had like a hundred people um, and uh, statistically st significant results. And uh, so, and at the time I was a, an editor for a psychology organization, a different psychology organization. And uh, man, it, it really made people angry in that field. Uh, because when, whenever you mention ESP or psychic, or whatever, they just flip out. <laughs> but but he really poked, you know, a hornet's nest, I guess. And uh, yeah, and it forced me to 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 start reading more about psych uh, about precognition specifically, uh, which is what he was uh, what he was finding. Um, and uh, and at the time, I and then I realized, oh, you know, I've had dreams like that. I've had dreams that were about something that happened the next day, and I've, I I just swept it under the rug. You know, I just I didn't have a mental framework for it, or a conceptual framework for it, and uh, so I had ignored it. And that's what happens. That's what that's what that's what happens when you have a an experience uh, that just doesn't fit your cultural models or your beliefs. Uh, it it it's surprising and shocking. And then there's this magical way in which your memory just erases it, like like the ocean, you know, erasing a, a drawing in the sand or whatever. Um, but I, I started paying attention. And then I started paying attention specifically to my dreams. That's the, that's, it's in dreams that people are most likely to experience precognition on a daily life or be conscious of experiencing it. Um, and I realized, oh my God, I'm having precognitive dreams all the time and just had never paid attention to it because I didn't have that sort of as part of my belief system, I guess. Um, so that's how, you know, that's how I started studying this about 10 years ago. And then I've, I've um, been writing about it on my blog throughout that time. And I wrote a book called Time Loops in 2018 that uh, really delved into, I think, the science of precognition and the possible uh, physical explanations for this. This is not a, you know, this is not a supernatural phenomenon. Um, this is, I'm, you know, quite confident it's going to have a, uh, a scientific explanation and probably in not too long. Um, there are a lot of converging areas of research that are pointing to an explanation for it. So that's a long answer to your question. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's, that's great. Um, so can you explain a little bit, I know it's kind of self-explanatory maybe, but like for some people that don't exactly understand what precognition is, right. and then also what are some of the big barriers to understanding it? And maybe you could speak a little bit about um, skepticism and the scientism. Sure. Okay. Well, what is precognition? It's any kind of uh, it usually it's defined as knowing the future or seeing the future. Um, it's any kind of, I, I define it more generally as any kind of being influenced by events or experiences ahead in time, okay, through 
through some other means than ordinary prediction. I mean, we all predict the future. We all imagine uh, what's going to happen tomorrow and make decisions based on our predictions. But precognition is more specific. It's 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 having a dream about something very specific uh, that's going to happen tomorrow or maybe in a year, you know, or maybe in 30 years. I mean, there's plenty of examples of this that, uh, you know, that's, there's no way you can predict it consciously. Um, but, but somehow the future is influencing us in the present. Okay. Um, so it's hard, it's very hard to study. And that's actually one of the things that I find really interesting about the subject um, is, you know, how can you, a, first, first of all, like with, with dreams, hardly anybody, you know, a, a, a tiny fraction. Okay. We all dream. We all dream two and a half hours a night, roughly. Um, you know, a tiny fraction of people pay attention to their dreams. You know, unfortunately we live in a culture that has completely lost the value of the dream world. I, I'm sure I, you understand what I'm talking about. And then, okay. So even if you pay attention to your dreams, um, you know, how many people are actually writing them down? How many people are at all thinking in terms of the possibility that they could relate to something that happens later? Now, this is a very common belief. In fact, every culture throughout the world and throughout history that we know of has believed that some dreams at least predict the future. I mean, that's just an unproblematic statement, uh, except in, in the West, you know, since the Enlightenment, all right? Um, now, so we live in a culture that just doesn't even stop to think, even if you pay attention to your dreams, like in a Freudian way or a Jungian way, you know, you may be looking for archetypes, you may be looking for, you know, and even experiencing synchronicities, you may, you know, have a dream, and then, you know, the next day, something happens that resembles your dream, but you're not going to think in terms of precognition, you're going to think, well, it's, you know, it's God gives, you know, it's, it's, it's the universe giving me the thumbs up or, or whatever. There are a lot of common ways in which we phrase kind of synchronicity. Um, but uh, no one's thinking in, in these terms that, that, oh, my, somehow my dreaming brain is, is presenting an image of, or, or, a, or a story about something that's happening in the future. And that's like impossible in terms of our understandings of causality. Um, uh, so it's, it's like, okay, so like, it's like that, that amnesia phenomenon that I mentioned earlier, it's like people don't pay attention to this. If they do, you know, they notice a connection between a dream and a subsequent event, they're just, they're not gonna, you know, they're not gonna pay attention to it. Um, so there, and, and if they do notice that connection, they're not probably going to have written down their dream, <laughs> you know? beforehand because so few people keep a detailed dream journal so it's like a skeptic can always say well you're just distorting your memory or you've you know um you know, this is not evidence of anything um so but and and the thing is with dreams even leaving aside precognition you're always in the realm of what scientists call anecdote okay um even within psychology dream studies and the study of dreams has always kind of been this marginal kind of thing because it's so difficult to study objectively people's dreams. I mean, you know, even if you assume that dreams are related to past experience or your memories or whatever, you know, to show that, to show connections between dream content and events in your life is really difficult. You've got to put people in a sleep lab, first of all, and that, that, right there is a is a difficulty it's it's i've been in a sleep study before for a completely different reason you know uh because i have sleep apnea and uh and it's a pain in the ass to spend one night in in a in a sleep lab let alone a few nights uh in a sleep lab so there's that um you know and if you've got funding you know you're going to be able to put a few people in a sleep lab uh and then you've got to give them all similar experiences you know uh during the day and you know the point is that the 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 difficulties add up to studying dreams and the thing is we all dream idiosyncratically you know um uh, one person may represent a certain experience a certain way another person will represent another way and for person a it may not even be a significant experience so they might not even show up in their dreams whereas you know so you, you get so many difficulties uh with studying dreams and then 
then the added problem of precognition and which at this point mainstream uh, scientists don't acknowledge publicly, even if they do actually <laughs> believe, it, believe in it, there's so much pressure uh, in, in academic uh, settings against uh, acknowledging anything that is paranormal. Um, and so, you know, the, you, you get very few people able and willing to study it um, scientifically. Uh, other reasons for the kind of skepticism, um, I mentioned the enlightenment. Okay, so, so it used to be the case that among the causes that we, that philosophers acknowledge uh, in the world were teleological causes. And this is teleology, this was one of Aristotle's, you know, types of causation. And that is to say cause from the future, all right? Um, but in the enlightenment, it was very important you know, the, the number one rule of the enlightenment is you can't bring the divine in, okay? And for them, teleology just Im immediately implied God's plan, okay? And so that wasn't fair to, to incorporate God's plan in your explanation for any, anything that you're studying in, in nature, okay? Um, and so, you know, it was just that that was booted out you know, as forbidden, essentially. Um, and that has, that assumption has governed, you know, physics and all the sciences that sort of emerge from our, our understanding of physics, you know, chemistry, biology, and so on. Um, and it, you know, it worked. I mean, we have to credit that enlightenment framework for all the technical you know, achievements of the last few hundred years, and and certainly they're they're tremendous. Um, but it's that assumption that a cause from the future has to do with God and the divine that has sort of been a mental block, you know, against this idea of of what we now call what physicists now call retro causation. That is to say, cause that goes backwards. Um, any kind of precognitive dream is an example of retro causation. Okay, that event in the future is somehow causing me to have a dream about it today. You know, which goes against our ideas about about um, causation. The thing is, it doesn't really go against physicists' understanding of of how causes can work. Actually, the idea of retro causation is not that controversial in physics. Um, the trouble is, it's very hard to test. And physicists have sort of their own versions of the difficulties that psychologists or parapsychologists do in studying uh, studying retro causation. Because how do you how do you distinguish a cause from the future versus something a cause from the past? I mean, it's very it's very it's very tricky, and it's only in the rec in recent years, like really the last honestly the last couple decades, that quantum physicists have developed sensitive enough tools that they can start to see what look like retrocausal effects in the quantum world. Um, uh, and so, you know, there are all kinds of scientific biases and cultural biases against um, anything like retro causation. Um, and, 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 and again, when you start to talk about precognition or precognitive dreams, it's, uh, people immediately go to like supernatural. They think this is somehow supernatural. And if they believe in the supernatural, then okay. But if they don't believe in the supernatural, which, which most scientifically educated people or a lot of scientifically educated people, you know, kind of really don't, uh, then they're just, there's an automatic kind of gate that shuts down when you, when you even mention a word like, like precognition or whatever. And that's not, you know, and, and that's, again, that's not what I mean by the term, I'm, I'm, I'm very confident that, that, uh, that, that precognition is a function of, of the brain um, and, and it will have a physical explanation. You know, I, you know, I like to think in my lifetime, it will become more accepted. Uh, and the reason being, uh, we see a, a lot of, really interesting trends right now in the sciences that are all pointing towards an explanation. You have uh, quantum biology, for instance, which is, you know, looking for quantum effects 
uh, in in the in the brain at a molecular level, and uh, there's even a uh, I think a good candidate for the molecules that may underlie precognition. And we could get to that if you want to. Um, uh, but likewise, it's being shown right now in the emerging field of quantum computing that in a quantum computer, uh, you can reverse you know, the temporal sequence of a computation, okay? So it's essentially showing what I think is happening in the brain uh, in quantum computers. Uh, and a lot of people think the brain is gonna turn out to be a quantum computer. I think it's gonna be turn out to be a sort of a hybrid, you know, incredibly, complex hybrid of quantum and classical computing. But um, uh, so I, I think there are a lot of, there are a lot of lines of research that are pointing to, to a physical explanation for it. Um, yeah. So like you mentioned um, that you, you were yourself a materialist. So I'm wondering how these experiences that you have had with precognition and writing your dreams now for, you know, for, decades or however long it's been how has that changed your view of um, of reality your view of yourself your understanding of your own identity yeah well okay i say i, I say i'm a materialist i kind of like this to to represent for materialists because materialists get a bad rap in in these kinds of discussions you know people especially in around the paranormal um uh, they, you know, they, it's like materialism is like a bad guy and, and, and we get blamed for, you know, the sort of denial around, uh, paranormal phenomena in general. Uh, and I, I think that, I think materialism isn't the right word. I think that, that, that you can imagine a much more expanded and interesting materialism than the kind of caricature that we get from, uh, from very reductive and very, uh, denialist kind of science, you know, or scientific um, uh, pedants <laughs> like Richard Dawkins and stuff like that. I mean, you you get kind of a pedantic, reductive materialism that kind of gives materialism a bad name. But I, I by materialist, I just mean that there's a, you know, I, I think that there's kind of a single reality, and we can fit these, we can fit some very bizarre stuff into that into that uh, natural world, um, uh, and so. You know that's that's the sense in which I call myself a materialist, but there are a lot of different flavors of materialism, as I'm sure you understand. And I I'm not I, I don't think I like to think I'm not the reductive uh, <laughs> the, the hyper reductive uh, type. Um, but uh, now I've, I'm forgetting what your question was. Yeah, I was I was wondering how um, your experiences. Well, the, the the first part was the materialism thing, and I, I feel like the materialism we could. The whole conversation could be just on that because there's so many subtle layers right. of materialism and, there, and there's so many different ways of understanding it. Right. But I, I guess the other question, the other part of it was um, how did having the precognitive dreams, how did that change your right. sense of yourself and your sense of reality? Right. And one yeah. more thing that I would say is I, I think the, the thing with materialism, like how I understand it within myself is it kind of disenchants the world. It kind of makes like, we're gonna, and even some of the things you're kind of saying about how we'll be able to explain this. Like it's, it, it has this flavor of like, we'll be able to, like we could explain everything away. We'll be able to understand everything. We'll be able to control everything. And, and that kind of takes, um, it like takes the enchantment away from the world. Like everything could be explainable. Everything could be understood. So that's kind of like, that's the thing. That's why I'm wondering if that, was impacted and and it because it still seems like you're saying like eventually we'll be able to explain this or like show it by science and i'm like wondering if well maybe this is not something that we'll be able to explain with science but it's just something that you have to experience like you've experienced because you've done so much of this like it's it's had to change you somehow and it's had to change your idea of reality and you didn't need like science to do that because you experienced it so I'm wondering if it's like people could just do this and, and experience this and have it change their understanding of themselves in reality without us mm -hmm. all having like, well, look, there's all these studies. Yeah, I'm not talking about studies. You know, I, I'm not um, when I when I think in terms, you know, science is a lot broader than than like, la you know, boring lab studies, you know, and, and boring 
articles in scientific journals. It's like, I, I, you know, I never write those articles because like, who cares? <laughs> I don't want to, uh, you know, I, the, um, you know, there's, there's different kinds of science, you know, the, the broader understanding of science includes, you know, exploration, you know, um, I think of, I think of precognition, uh, you know, I'm, I'm all, I'm all in favor of doing laboratory studies because that's, that's an important part of it. But um, to me, what's going to change the conversation is just is having getting people to have the experience themselves. And that, the, the comparison I make is to like, if you're an explorer in the, um, you know, back, you know, back when in the mid 1800s or whatever, and you come back from Africa and say, look, I've seen these, these animals that they're, they're like gigantic you know, apes living in the forest, you know, they're called gorillas. And, and people are just like, no, there's, they, they, that, that doesn't exist. You know, that doesn't exist. Well, th what, what gets, changes people's minds is, well, you just go into the forest and you bring out a gorilla and show them. Okay. And that's kind of how I think of precognition. You have to show them the gorilla, you know, you have to have them have a personal experience of it. Um, I, you know, no one's going to convince anybody with, with uh, journal articles in science that precognition exists. That's not gonna change anybody's mind, but getting enough people to pay attention to their dreams and have the experience that they cannot explain away or cannot deny, you know, that I had a dream about something happening, you know, three days later that was totally un unpredictable, you know, getting people to have that experience is, is exactly what it takes. Um, to change the conversation. It's like, I, I'm not, my, my goal is not for this to turn into this scientific reductive thing, but I also disagree with you that, that science disenchants. I mean, that's a narrative that's been, that's been around since, um, uh, since the late, you know, I, I didn't, I 18, didn't say 1800s. I didn't say but, that science disenchants. And I agree with uh, you that the idea of science, my, the way I understand materialism or the way that, um, everything becomes very narrow and everything needs to be explained only in science. And if, if we don't have the evidence or if we, we can't explain it in this narrow view of science, then the, it can't be real or there's nothing beyond this. Yeah. But what you're doing, that's the caricature though, of the materialist scientist. And honestly, I work with scientists. My day job is with, mm -hmm. with, with scientists, neuroscientists mm -hmm. mostly. And they're not like that. I mean, most, most scientists actually, you see, you're responding to the, the caricature. And I think that there are a lot of kind of pedantic people like Dawkins and, you know, those types that, that get up there and say, if we, you know, if this is not part of, science academic science then it, it's not real you know and it's like those that's not what i'm talking about i mean those those people are you know th that they're on a power trip or of some kind um most scientists are perfectly able to bracket you know the kinds of questions that science addresses and and to do science but have you know understand that there's like a vast universe of things that science will never be able to understand or or not yet understand and that's so i'm i'm you know science is good for certain things and we need it you know but but it, it can't answer all the questions and we need the humanities you know it's like there's the classic distinction between the, the sciences which study causes and the humanities which study meanings and what interests me about precognition is it's it straddles that you need you need an understanding of the science an understanding of the physics and understanding all that 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 enhances your understanding of what's going on meaningfully with a precognitive dream, for instance. And this is why in my books, I, I talk a lot about Freud and the psychoanalytic tradition, because uh, although we can't take, you know, everything Freud said, you know, <laughs> without a grain of salt, but he was really trying to straddle these two spheres. You know, he was, he very much saw himself as a kind of a part of the, the emerging neurosciences. Okay. And he really wanted there to be a physical ability to explain the unconscious, but he was, he was drawing as much on literary criticism and philosophy and tr really tr creating a method that, that merged those. And that's, that's really inspiring to me because that's what I'm trying to do uh, in studying, you know, precognition. I mean, you need both. You need the science, the scientific approaches, but you need the, the humanities uh, and you cannot lose sight of this fact that it's a meaningful phenomenon and science can't grasp meanings at all, really. Um, so, uh, you need um, uh, you need these uh, these multiple 
I, I, multiple I, I, approaches. But it's like you did, you did. I did want to ask answer your other question though, because you mm -hmm. asked how it affected my understanding. Well, it it just it it was transformative. I mean, I uh, it uh, to to have you know one two precognitive dreams is like you know this starts to raise questions. Okay, and if you take it take these these things seriously and not think, oh, I'm imagining it or whatever. And the, and the thing is though, that doubt creeps in again and again and again, and you have to start, you have to have these experiences repeatedly for it to start to stick and to start to sink in that, okay, this is real and I have to deal with this. I have to incorporate this in my worldview. I can't kick it out of my worldview. And that was huge for me. It was a, it was the biggest paradigm shift, you know, of my life, you know, and I've had, you know, I've had religious experiences that were a paradigm shift too, but this was bigger uh, um, because yeah, everything that we've learned in our culture, both explicitly, but also kind of implicitly, you know, just causation goes a single direction and we don't, you know, we, we it's hard to question that. Uh, and a precognitive dream or a waking precognitive experience um, uh, just throws that into upheaval. Uh, and I guess my first book was really my a result of my wrestling with this topic um, for, you know, for several years by that point. And not only in, in the realm of dreams, uh, but, you know, grappling with the physics, you know, I spent, you know, a few years, you know, try, for, you know, I'm not a physicist or I'm, and I, you know, you start you throw me an equation, I like, you know, but, uh, you know, there are enough you know, there aren't too many, but there are enough physicists who are able to, to talk about and write about quantum physics in a way that you can understand it if you're smart and, and can, you know, uh, can sort of push through the jargon and stuff like that. Uh, so I spent a lot of time trying to understand that and trying to understand, you know, and then, and then, you know, relating it to, um, to psychoanalytic theory and so on. Um, but it was a, yeah, it was a huge paradigm shift and it's and it's uh and it's one that i highly recommend i mean uh i've it's there's nothing more paradigm shattering honestly and nothing more um uh that you know that will just on a repeated basis give you this kind of intellectual high of of really thinking rethinking everything you thought you knew about causality and about yourself and so on and so and you asked how it changed my understanding of myself well yeah that's the that's the biggest thing because you suddenly you suddenly realize and i think we we kind of have this implicit sense that that the past is gone okay and the future is unknowable and how could it affect us now okay but when you start to realize that oh the future by future because you know, an experience I have today, I can look in my dream journal from, you know, sometimes decades ago and see, oh, I dreamed about this, you know, 20 years ago, you know, on this exact date, that's a very common phenomenon that like the, you know, we have a mental calendar and it somehow knows what date it is. And it's that, that is mind blowing because you realize that, that, well, by extension, my future is influencing my dreams tonight in a way that I can't know, but it, it's, you know, my future is a part of who I am right now, uh, which is, that's mind blowing in and of itself, but then add to it the implication that my thoughts today, my experiences today influenced my past. Okay. So my past is I'm, I'm influencing my past right now. Okay, so then that just blows up that notion that, oh, the past is dead and gone and the future doesn't matter. Not true, you know? And that's why I use the term the long self. You start to have to expand, broaden our understanding of the self as this four-dimensional, this fully four-dimensional creature um, that, you know, that's, uh, and that, you know, our minds are not, you know, our memory, it's not just memory that's, you know, built up by experiences. I mean, we're, our memory goes both directions. Uh, and there are interesting reasons why our memory for things future 
is a lot more vague and symbolic and hard to <laughs> detect than our memory for things past. But but memory goes both directions. And um, and these, you know, and dreams you can think of as little wormholes, you know, wormholes through time, you know, that bring two points in your life, you know, folded into contact. And that's just that's just mind blowing. Um, so the more you have these experiences, and the more you're able to put it into a, a framework like that. Uh, it's just it's stunning. Um, but I think it helps to have that scientific understanding. It helps to have a kind of at least a mental model of like a wormhole, um, you know, which, you know, that that is thanks to science. That's thanks to cosmology that, that we have. We can we have these models now that we can we can use to understand this. Carl Jung in 1950 didn't have that. And, you know, he was trying to understand these experiences, but he didn't have uh, the models that science is able to, to provide us now. Uh, and so he was forced to say, you know, look, it's, it's, it's a causal, it's, you know, he's forced to invent a word, you know, whenever, he, whenever a scientist wants to explain something new, but they can't really explain it, they invent a word. So he invented synchronicity. And, uh, and unfortunately, that term has, while it's a great term, it also kind of keeps people from trying to investigate how, how it's working. It's just say, well, it's, it's that synchronistic, that's synchronicity, it's, you know, and, and so they don't go deeper. Yeah. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to do in my new book is to go deeper and say, look, you can shine this, this new, this new um, scientifically informed light on these amazing experiences in your life and see what's going on. Like, it's like an X-ray, like putting a person in an X-ray. Suddenly you see this internal structure to this thing that just seemed beyond our capacity to understand. And that's, you know, you, like, okay, so when you said that, you know, explaining things feels like it takes away the, the enchantment or mystery, in my experience of, of learning about things scientifically is that it only expands the questions, you know? Um, you know, like, like, you know, think about what astronomy did to the, to the pre-astronomy cosmology, you know? It's like you had a dome and you had, you know, the, uh, the wanderers and stuff like that. But like, think how just un inconceivably vast and mysterious the universe is now, thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope, you know, and thanks to the, you know, the new telescope that's, uh, you know, it's like, it's gonna be, you know, it's just, it's, it's inconceivably more fascinating and wonderful and full of possibility and mystery than, than you know, it was before. So I, you know, I think whenever you, you explain something, that doesn't mean you're you've you're it's dead and done and you're you can move on that it it it's just expanding uh exponentially the number of questions and mysteries uh so that's how i see you know the progress of science personally yeah um some of the things you were saying i mean like you know all of this just shatters our understanding of what time is and that's just you know one of the fundamental aspects of reality space and time and it's just uh it just yeah it just completely changes everything and you you keep bringing up um uh freud and young and those are two of the you know most notable people who study dreams and most people know about them but how did freud and young view dreams and how does your understanding of dreams contrast with theirs yeah, great question. Okay, so Freud, first of all, he now he was not the first person to talk about an unconscious or the unconscious. Uh, a lot of writers and philosophers, in the especially in the century leading up to Freud, had talked in terms of an unconscious. It was starting to be people were being becoming aware in psychiatry, for instance, that there were all these things that happened that people weren't conscious of, you know, and, and that, that couldn't be explained sim simply by the conscious mind. Um, but uh, so, you know, Freud was influenced by those people, but then uh, what he discovered was this incredible method called free association. Now it had already been known that memory and the brain somehow works on association. You know, the one idea links to another idea and it's usually in an illogical way. You know, whatever, it, it, it follows the logic of how you've ex you know, learned about these things in your life. You know, you, you, uh, you learned about, you know, the Battle of Waterloo, but, but you know, at the, you know, when you, that, during that lecture, 
uh, there was a smell of smoke from a, a fire next door. And so you will always associate the Battle of Waterloo with that smoke. And that's this unique thing to you. But that what Freud realized was is those associations are what govern our dreams. So if you, you know, are dreaming about, you know, something in your childhood, for some reason, you're not going to dream about, you know, if, if you want to dream about, you know, for him, dreams were mainly about unresolved conflicts and psychosexual stuff. So say, you know, you see your parents having sex or whatever. That was a kind of classic trauma, you know, for, <laughs> for uh, you know, children during the Victorian era, you know. Um, well, you know, later in life, you may have a dream that's not, doesn't, you know, not, not, not a, vi a, a visual representation of your parents having sex. It's, it's, it's a dream that's assembled from the things, your mental associations to that scene, which is, which he thought, well, it's too, like too disturbing and distressing. Uh, so instead you have a dream about, you know, the, the smell of flowers on the windowsill that, that, you know, was accompanying that scene and and some you know something that was going on in another room you know or or what you were wearing and or whatever you know he'll, he'll have a dream that's assembled of those associations and what he discovered um was that if you put a patient on a couch and just have them talk about you know what's the first thing that dream symbol you know those flowers in the vase what's the first thing that that calls to mind and you know it's like like they'll go, oh gosh, you know, that those, those are just like the, the flowers were on the windowsill when I, you know, <laughs> saw this thing I didn't want to see, you know, so that, you know, led to an understanding of dream content in a new way. Uh, and whatever else you say about Freud, and you can, you know, you can set aside all the sexual stuff that people kind of reductively associate with Freud. Um, that method of free association is super important. And if you've done any dream interpretation, you know that like, you know, you can puzzle over the meaning, the symbolic meaning of a dream uh, for days, but all, all you have to do is like sit back and just kind of be honest with yourself. You know, like, okay, what's, what is that? You know, what's that car in my dream remind me of? And like, you know, inevitably, it'll, well, not inevitably, but often it'll, It'll, there'll be something that it reminds you of. And that may not be the answer to the meaning of the dream, but that's part of the process of decoding the dreams, like figuring out what are those, those associations. So that was, that was key for Freud, um, Freud's theory of dreams. Now he thought the purpose of dreams was to, uh, was to represent um, repressed wishes, okay? That he thought that, okay, the dreams are always about, uh, they're all wish fulfillment was his theory of dreams. Now I think he's wrong about that. And I explain why in the new book, but that basic method of free association, that's really, that's really key. Um, now, yeah, and then Jung, okay, so Jung, uh, Jung felt that you, well, Freud was way too reductive about sex and all that. And F Jung was very interested in religion, world religion and world mythology. Um, and uh, he saw lots of connection uh, in his patient's dreams and his own dreams between uh, the symbolism in the dreams and myths um, from around the world. And so he, you know, developed this idea of archetypes, you know, the idea that, well, if you go deeper, you know, his, his sort of model was, well, Freud was exploring the sort of shallow caves, you know, in the earth's crust. But if you go deeper in the earth's crust, you come to this area where all of our dreams, you know, all of our dream symbolism, you know, comes together. And it's, and it's these, uh, these sort of ancient, um, uh, sort of archetypal, this ancient archetypal realm. And so he was interested in this kind of uh, mythic dimension to dreams. Um, so where do I uh, come in to all this? I, as I said, I think free association and, and Jung was down with free association as well. I mean, he was a, a student of Freud until they kind of had a split about the, um, about some of these, you know, the archetypal stuff that, that Jung was interested in. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, the uh, free association thing is key. And, and for a dream worker, uh, who wants to start detecting precognition in their dreams, uh, that's one of the, the, the steps. I sort of break it down into three 
steps and here I'll, I'll just give this away right now. Um, you know, anyone who wants to start precognitive dream work, all they need to know uh, is there are these three things. Uh, first, write down all your dreams in as much detail as you can. Every dream, every dream, you know, don't, don't, fall into the trap of thinking, oh, well, that was a very trivial or bizarre seeming dream that couldn't be important. They're all equally important, all equally likely to be pre precognitive. Um, they don't have to be numinous. You'll sometimes hear that term, numinous dreams are more likely to be precognitive. That's a total myth. Um, so write down all your dreams in as much detail as you can. Second step, and this is what, this is what I think is original in, in what I'm writing because other writers have talked about dream precognition before, but they haven't recommended this step, which is free associate. And that means, and, and don't free associate with the idea that you're gonna get the meaning of the dream. I'm, forget about meaning, just free associate, figure out what those associations are to the elements in your dream when you write it down. Uh, and you're not going to know what the dream's about. If it's precognitive, you're not gonna know what the dream's about when you write it down, but, very often it's those associations that you write down uh, that will help you make the link to a later event, okay? And the third step, and this is something that nobody who keeps a dream journal thinks to do. And it's something I kept a dream journal for, you know, I kept a dream journal for what, I don't know, 10 or 15 years by this, before I even started becoming aware of precognitive dreaming and started doing this step, which is, go back to your recent dream records every night, okay? Um, before you go to bed, just the end of the day, look at your dream record from that morning and the dream records from the previous couple of days. And just think, just, you know, just like, just look at those dream records, like, you know, like what, you know, and those associations that you had written down to them. And just, just think if anything connects, you know, connects to what happened in that, in those last few days. Uh, and that's how you're gonna start detecting precognitive dreams. Um, and people who do this exercise and start doing it over the course of a week or two um, will often find that about one in four of their dreams has a recognizable, if only just sort of intriguing connection to some event that happened within the next few days afterwards. And some of them will be just like, oh my God, like, that's it. I mean, I dreamed about that episode in my life, you know, beforehand. So that's how you, that's how to, that's how you do it. And that's taking that important idea from Freud about, about free association. Um, yeah, so I, I guess that answers your question. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned uh, like writing down all your dreams and not, you know, not, oh, this one is, seems so significant and this one doesn't yeah. seem significant. And I, I believe that's one of the principles in your book. You mentioned 27 of them, uh, 27 principles for precognitive dream work. Which do you believe are the most vital uh, or like the most counterintuitive? Maybe you could share one or two other ones that you mentioned. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh... Let me think. Uh, I haven't looked at that list of seven principles in a few months, so it's like I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to uh, search my memory here. What? Well, okay. Some of the. All right. One of the really important ones, and this is going to be for people who have kept a dream journal for a long time. I'm sure some of your listeners probably have. I mean, some people do keep, you know, keep a dream journal regularly. Uh, go back. Okay, if something kind of big happens in your life, um, significant, go back, look at your dreams from exactly a year before or exactly multiple years before. Uh, and this is, this is a, a, a principle uh, of dreams that I don't think has really been ever described um, before, and it's what I call calendrical resonance. Uh, dreams typically, I mean, you're going to most often notice dreams relating to an event in the next few days, but uh, there are a lot of exceptions to this. And one big exception is that kind of major upheavals in our life 
uh, we dream about years beforehand, sometimes a year, sometimes multiple years, and not always on exactly the same date, but it happens enough that it's a, it's a, it's a thing. And uh, it happens in my own uh, in my own dream journals, other dream workers I've, I've worked with in the last couple of years have noticed exactly the same thing. And I've got some incredible examples of this in the book. Um, uh, so like I said, the, the, we have an internal calendar and we're not conscious of it. That's the, that's the amazing thing. Like, uh, you know, I can't, I can't even tell you what date it is today. Um, you know, but somehow if, if my brain tonight, you know, uh, it's aware of what date is today. And if there's a significant event that happens exactly in a year on this same date, that may well be spark a dream tonight, okay? So being aware of those dates of your dreams is very important to date your dreams. Um, that's why, it, and it's keep them all together in a searchable fashion, even if it's just handwritten notebooks, date your dreams. Um, cause this is a, this is a very important, um, uh, and, 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 and mind blowing, honestly, I mean, it's, it's mind blowing enough to have a dream about an event, um, that's in your future, you know, it's like three days in your future or one day, you know, that's mind blowing enough, but to have a dream that's multiple years in your future, um, or I'm saying to detect a dream that was multiple years before, you know, an event that's, that's, that has happened uh that is that is you know par again it's paradigm altering to have that and and it's even more amazing to see that your dream knew what date it was and your brain somehow knew what day it was <laughs> and, and uh sparked a dream on that date um you know i i had well, I, there, like I said, there are a lot of examples of this um, in the book for, you know, if readers are interested, it's, it's really, it's amazing. Um, other things to look for in the dream world are what I call time gimmicks. Um, very often, and this is something I, I only noticed, you know, through studying of my own dreams over years with the idea, with paying attention to precognition. Uh, was that very often I would have dreams that had some sort of time travel theme in them, or, or if not time travel, then some kind of anachronism, some kind of juxtaposition of old and new, you know, um, you know, the, it's, I, I give a lot of examples in the book, but there's, you know, paying attention to anachronisms in dreams, those seem to be tip-offs of that not just that the dream is precognitive, precognitive, but that you're going to discover the precognitive referent of the dream when it's happening. Most of the time, precognitive dreams are going to be detected after the event that you precognize. It's like you go back to your dream journal, for instance, and oh, yesterday I had this experience, and like the, then, then two days before I, you know, I dreamed about it, but it's not while the event is happening. A dream is here, here's, I guess, a, a very important principle. Um, a dream is a sort of an associative bundle about a waking experience or a set of waking experiences during a very confined span of waking life. And that span is, I don't know how to define it yet, but in my experience, it's never more than a few hours, okay? Uh, but if multiple like interesting salient things happen during that window of time, even if they're unrelated to each other, they'll get mashed up into a dream, okay, a, a precognitive dream. And, uh, and so, the, so weirdly, we kind of assume that a dream is going to be about a single event or a single um, experience. But sometimes it can be about multiple experiences if they happen closely, really close in time, like in the same afternoon. Um, you can have a dream. And, and the thing is, if you, if you notice it when it's happening, if you say, oh gosh, this is like that dream I had, you'll often find that that dream had some sort of time travel gimmick in it or some uh, time gimmick uh, or an anachronism or whatever, which I think is a, is a representation. Get this now, this is another mind blowing <laughs> feature of the dream world. 
it's a representation in your dream of the fact that you will be looking back at that dream later. Okay. It's, I mean, it's, it is, it is trippy to say the least to, to look in your dream journal, like to have an experience and go, oh, I dreamed this and go back and open up your dream journal and go, yep, yep, I, I dreamed this. But right there in your dream journal from like two days ago or whatever is, uh, you you know, some element of the dream that's kind of about time travel, okay? Which is a, an associative like symbol of the fact that you're going back in time, literally in that, in that um, dream journal. And, and, you know, that you're, you're going back in time by reading your dream journal right then. And it's, it is incredibly loopy and bizarre, but it's, it's really wild. <laughs> and that's like, it's, it's these experiences that, that make uh, precognitive dream work. So, you know, incredible and fascinating and rewarding. I mean, it's just like to have that, that, you know, like I said, it's like a, you know, completely natural high to, to to discover these things um in your in your life and in your dream life so those are a few um i'll probably think of a few more as we're talking but yeah i think um yeah the, the fractal nature i remember you yeah. writing that like yeah. you recognizing that in the dream you were actually <laughs> dreaming about yourself there was something there showing that you're gonna actually yeah. be reviewing this dream so it has this like fractal nature that just twists back on itself mm -hmm. There was another thing I think that you wrote that I, might be important to mention is that dreams are not necessarily about like the what's going to happen in the future, but they're more so about your experience. So it's not right. like it could be about you reading about an event that is a complete yeah. distortion of the actual event that happens, but your experience is going to be you reading that newspaper. So you're dreaming about you reading that newspaper, not about the actual event that's going to happen. Right. Yeah, that's super important. I'm glad you I'm glad you brought that up. In fact, that's I think this is number one principle in the book uh, that that dreams are about our experiences. They are about they're about things that we are going to feel and think uh, and see and so forth in our future. They're not about remote events happening in space time. OK, so, you know, lots of people dreamed about 9-11, for instance. Uh, I dreamed about 9-11. Um, you know, before it happened, but they're not dreaming about the the planes crashing into the towers or whatever. That's their kind of an intuitive mental model, I think, of of psychic phenomena, is that events happening in the world are they're somehow explosive, uh, somehow ripple through space time, and 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 we pick them up through some sort of psychic antenna, and that's not how it works. Uh, like I said, precognition is an aspect of our memory. It's not a kind of perception. Um, so in fact, what we're, what we're doing when we have a precognitive dream about 9-11, say, is, uh, is we, you know, we're, we're dreaming about our reactions to seeing that unfold on CNN. Uh, and you can, and the thing is, there's ways you can tell the difference between, um, between actual events out in the world and the way we experience them or way we learn about them. Um, and this was, uh, I'd, if we have time, I'd like to talk a little bit about J.W. Dunn. He was the he was the, really the pioneer of of studying precognitive dreams, and he wrote a book um, in 1927 called "An Experiment An Experiment with Time." Is the name of his book. And uh, this he was a English aeronautical engineer. Um, he was in the first days of essentially the aerospace industry, back uh, designing some of the first airplanes um, in in Britain, this was like right after the Wright brothers uh, in the United States. And he was designing very early airplanes, in fact, early monoplanes. He was, he was really interested in those. Um, and he, uh, but he also noticed that he dreamed often of events that were gonna happen in the, in the future. Um, uh, for instance, he had a famous dream in 1900, I believe, uh, when he was fighting in the Boer War in South Africa. Uh, he had a dream of, uh, of, and that there was a, he was on an island with a volcano that was about to blow and he was running around trying to warn the French speaking people on this island that, that 40,000 people were about to die. Um, uh, or sorry, sorry, that 4,000 people were going to die. Um, and uh, a few days later, the news, uh, a newspaper was delivered, you know, to his 
um, his troop in the you know out in the bush, uh, and the headline in the newspaper was forty thousand people die on the French island of Martinique in a volcano explosion. Okay, uh, but this was just the first of many ex examples like that um, that he um, that he re recorded and studied, uh, where he would read about some amazing thing in the newspaper and. Uh, and realized he dreamed about it. And he started recording his dreams and sort of studying them. And he had, and he brought this really brilliant forensic engineer's mind to the problem. I'm like, like he would investigate plane crashes. I mean, he, you know, he was friends with test pilots and sometimes they would die in plane crashes and he would investigate, you know, he would, you know, he knew how to examine what happened in a plane crash. And he sort of brought that same mindset to understanding um, his dreams. And he realized, for instance, in the, the volcano dream, you know, well, you know, the, the, the ultimate death toll turned out to be something like 36,000 or something like that. Like, you know, but he had dreamed this specific series of four and a bunch of zeros, you know, and that's exactly what he read in the newspaper. And he realized that he was not dreaming about that eruption, you know, he was dreaming about his experience of reading the newspaper. Um, and this is, so key because this is again and again and again when you study precognitive dreaming it always turns out to be about people's learning experiences not actual events uh another great example of this there's a a, a contemporary um what i call a precog someone who's you know regularly dreams you know vividly about about future events and in her case it's air disasters it's a woman named elizabeth crone uh, in, in, who lives in Houston. She's a grandmother uh, and she was, her story is incredible. She was struck by lightning in the parking lot of her synagogue back in 1988. And afterwards she started having regular precognitive dreams about, about, uh, about plane crashes for the most part and disasters. But, um, and she learned to like send herself, e send them to herself in emails um, eventually she learned this I and mean, there wasn't even email back in 88, but I mean, she eventually learned to send herself these dreams and emails. So she could kind of prove to herself that, okay, that she dreamed this before she read about the story in the news, but her dreams are very specifically about the picture that she will read, you know, that she will see online or in the newspaper. Uh, and for instance, her best example of this is she, uh, awoke from a dream. She was on a trip to Jerusalem with her husband. And she had a dream, like a very specific dream that an American airliner landed in the water in New York and the passengers were standing on the wings. And uh, sure enough, like six hours later, what goes viral on the internet, but all these pictures of the miracle on the Hudson, you know, where Chesley Sullenberger piloted to a safe landing on the Hudson River and all the passengers were standing on the wings of the plane waiting to be picked up by boats. And uh, so she was dreaming, you know, she wasn't dreaming the event, she was dreaming those pictures, you know, and this is true again and again and again in her, in her examples. Uh, but it's, you know, it's just a, it's, it's a really central, I'm really glad you remember that, because that's like the most basic, I think, principle of, of, of precognition and precognitive dream work, that it's not, this is not perception. And that term extrasensory perception um, it's misleading because it's not perception and it's not, it has nothing to do with the senses. You know, this is about memory, our memory that goes through time, you know, memory for things future. You write in your book, doesn't everything you're saying about precognition go against free will, you muttered. If future events are fixed, then doesn't that co-sign us to the most dismal kind of determinism, something like the predestination doctrine of the Calvinists? Why embark on the precognitive dream work path if all it does is show us things that are set in stone and we can't change them? So with, with everything that you are writing in your book, what are you implying about free will or, and how do you understand free will? Yeah, um, everyone asked this and I, I, I don't have a single answer to it. Um, the, I, I, I try to get people to set aside free will um, as, 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 as kind of mental baggage. It's like this, it's this philosophical issue that, yeah, that philosophers have sort of bequeathed to us, but it's not helpful in thinking about our lives. Um, I, I, uh, you know, on the one hand, we are, we are changing, we're constantly changing the world through our actions. Okay. We're, you know, we're free, you know, we're free, just as free as we think we are, you know, now, 
on some philosophical level, on some physical causal level, maybe it's totally deterministic, you know, but I feel free and I, I make, you know, what feel like free actions. And that's the best we can do. You know, we, we, we act uh, and we, and we are chain, we're constantly changing the present into the future. Okay. We're constantly, you know, the future is partly a product of my freely willed actions right now. We're all affecting the future. Okay. But people then make this kind of switch based on this idea of free will that somehow we can no free will or determinism means that we can't change the future, change the future from something else that it is that we all, we still don't know what that is. So it's like, it's actually this kind of incoherent idea, but nevertheless, being human beings, it somehow feels to us like physical confinement, like, like we're shackled or something like that. We want to do something, but that we can't, but that's not the way it is. I mean, we're, we're, like I said, we always act freely within the constraints of the physical world. Um, and, you know, we, we can't know how, we don't know what the future is going to be. This is, you know, pre precognition doesn't tell us what the future is going to be. You know, it's, it's a, a window onto, onto some little experience in the future, but we can't know, you know, we can't know the whole context. Um, so I, I try to get people to, to just set aside this idea of free will as just unhelpful mental baggage. I, uh, I, I come, okay, my sort of, my spiritual tradition is Zen, all right? And, um, you know, you get a lot of, a lot of Zen uh, enlightenment experiences actually in the, in the literature are of no free will. And, and and that's a blissful blissful realization for for people i mean this is it's 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 a common theme uh in you know the great zen masters of china and japan you know that they would have an experience that that in which the world was this big kind of kind of causal mechanism you know which sounds terrible it sound that sounds like like the reductionistic materialistic science that you know that we all blame for disenchanting the world but no it's when when they have these enlightenment experiences it's blissful it's blissful and the thing is when they then are able to set aside this baggage about free will it actually makes them more effective and happy and you know it's like someone who has set aside the baggage of free will is like this super effective martial arts master you know not you know, someone who's shackled, you know, but I think it's, so it's the, the, the shackle really is in our, is in the, the, the mental chains, the, the, you know, of, of trying to reconcile things with free will, just set aside. I mean, I, in my meditation practice, I used to, you know, put distract, take distracting thoughts. I used to sort of me mentally put them on a shelf. I used to have a shelf sort of imaginative, imaginary shelf up in, up here in my visual field. And I would just, you know, take a thought and I would just set it on the shelf. I wasn't, I didn't want to get rid of the thought and I was going to take it back afterwards, you know, but I just, you know, for a time I would just set it on the shelf. So I like to advise people just set free will on a shelf. You know, you don't have to get rid of it. You don't have to, you know, I'm not telling you to, to change your life and, 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 and no longer believe in free will, but just, you know, set it aside and see what it does for you to stop worrying about the question of free will because i don't think it's helpful yeah it's interesting a lot of the things you were saying um it seems it, it seems to me that um reality is in, indeterminate it's not determined it's indeterminate it's just every moment is just arising the way that it's arising um reality doesn't even know how it's going to unfold it's just unfolding how it's unfolding um and i would actually yeah. Well, I, I'd actually disagree with that. Mm -hmm. I, 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 uh, the, the model that the cosmological model that I, mm -hmm. that I think precognitive dreams give add proof to is actually the one that, that Einstein, uh, Einstein's work, you know, over a century ago pointed to, which is what's called the block universe. That is to say a universe, which in which the future is already determined, determinate as well. There is a single future out there in front of us, and it is, and 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 that's acting back on the past, just as the past is acting on the future. There's no indeterminacy, and in fact, uh, the the kind of one new interpretation of quantum of of quantum mechanics is this is, is that this whole idea of indeterminacy is wrong. That that in fact what we're calling indeterminacy and what 
for a century physicists have called randomness is actually direct evidence of retro causation. We just didn't have a way of detecting it or proving that this was retrocausal, but that but when you reframe uh, quantum mechanics in light of the idea of retrocausation, it makes it it creates what is called super determinism, which is mean which means that that not only is the past up to this point determined, but that our future is determined too. So it like it actually seems to like make make you know free will even more of a of a, of a non-existent thing. But uh, it's it's uh, yeah. So I would I I actually d don't like the sort of uh, indeterminate uncertain kind of thing. I think that if we get past that sort of need, that need for an open-ended future, like choose your own reality kind of thing, uh, that's that's where you start to have enlightenment experiences about the Locke universe, um, uh, which, you know, like I said, it's a theme throughout Zen literature, you know, of having an enlightenment experiences, which is about, essentially about the block universe. Um, and, uh, and if you, you know, precognitive dream work will lead to those enlightenment experiences, believe me. Yeah, I think what we're talking about is paradoxical. That's why uh, it starts to break down. <laughs> yeah. It's either way you try to frame it. And that's, I think that's the whole thing with free will too. It's a paradoxical thing. So as soon as we start we collapse into one way or the other, and it's and what what and the truth of it is something beyond uh, that linear logic. So, co correct me if I'm wrong, but this is kind of how I'm understanding uh, the reward of precognitive dream work is not that you change the content of your life, but you somehow change the context with how you relate to your life, and it's something akin to wisdom and meaning. Yeah, yeah, that's like that's exactly. That's exactly it. The number, uh, you know, set aside the idea. I, mean, I think people are drawn to this topic the same way they're drawn to like remote viewing, for instance, because they think that's going to give them a new superpower or whatever, you know, uh, this idea that they're going to, you know, they're going to get rich, you know, by precognizing the stock market or they're going to nevertheless have some kind of new superpower to navigate the world. And that's not, that's not what it is. Um, it's fine to like come at it that way. And that's how I came. Yeah, that's, that was my initial idea too. But uh, what, what it does is just greatly deepen your understanding of yourself and give you much heightened ex appreciation for yourself, your whole self. Uh, and that includes, you know, all those things in your past that you, that up till now, you know, were kind of shameful or embarrassing, or you didn't even, you know, they just, you know, you're just glad they're gone. Well, you, when you have a kind of a long self-understanding, you start to have a lot more sympathy for um, for mistakes you've made in the past and errors you've made. And you, because you start to realize that that we're all always making errors and mistakes of understanding. And that this is this actually follows from the the kind of precognitive model that that I explain sort of in the center middle part of the book. Um, we're necessarily misinterpreting. Uh, the world and including our dreams. You know, I I have dreams that I acted on. You know, I, they influence my life in some way. If you keep a dream journal, your dreams are influencing your life. I mean, even just the time taken to write it down a dream, that's an influence on your life. That's that through the butterfly effect, that <laughs> that that is a, a cause in your life. And the thing is, we're inevitably misinterpreting those dreams when they happen because we can't know the future, but we'll act upon those dreams. We'll make art based on our dreams. We'll tell a person our dreams, whatever. Those actions are based on our dreams are based from a position of not really understanding what those dreams mean. Um, but they lead us to the future where we have that experience, you know? So we're constantly engaged in what I call time loops, which that was the title of my first book, uh, where we are uh, in sort of mysterious ways causing our past and leading us to the present. So even if, you know, our past is full of meandering and mistakes and all that, you start to see that actually there might be meaning or not meaning, but there might be validity in, in the mistakes we made in the past that they, they in some way they directed us um, to the life we're living now and uh and the life we're going to be living in the future and uh it's it, it creates a sense of a whole 
that is more of a composition. You know, our lives are compositions and they, there's a lot of messiness in there, you know, and I think it gives you a greater appreciation of the mess of our lives. This is, this is actually goes to one of the reasons I like Freud so much is because, you know, I, I think people who are into Jung, you know, they, they kind of don't, they don't like that kind of messy aspect of our, our lives. They, they want to focus on the archetypes, the noble mythic stuff um, and the way our lives fit into those, those archetypal things. But Freud was, you know, one of the things that he insisted upon, and I think he was absolutely right here, is that dreams are, are, are really about the mess of our lives. They're about all the, not just the sexual stuff, but the, um, just the, the details, the trivial little details, you know, that of our, of our daily existence that we tend to ignore. Um, and when you start detecting how your dreams are full of that stuff, you know, on the one hand, you know, you can have a dream about something as trivial as, you know, uh, the sink backing up. That's an example from my book. Um, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's like, that's freaking mind blowing to have a dream, you know, about the sink backing up and then have it happen three hours later, you know, that it shatters your reality. And it doesn't matter that the thing it took to shatter that reality was something as stupid and and trivial as the sink backing up. There's nothing archetypal about the sink backing up, but it's, you know, it, it, it is, has equal capacity to blow your mind. And so precognitive dream work focuses you on that, on that kind of trivial, messy dimension of, of life. Um, you know, every, you know, every mistake you've made may have, may have kind of a, a larger rationale in terms of a long self that is looking out for itself. One thing, one caveat I'll say to this idea that it's not a superpower. In fact, it is a superpower and I think we're always exercising it and it's just simply called intuition. Um, whenever we make a decision based on some sort of irrational, you know, not deliberately thinking, um, but basic decision on intuition, we're using precognition. That's, that is precognition by another term because precognition is always operating. It's not just dreams. It's, 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 uh, it's those gut feelings. It's those, um, anytime you have a gut feeling that's kind of telling you to do something that your rational brain is, you know, is, is, is telling you not to do. I'm not saying always go with irrational gut feelings. You know, you have to kind of be judicious about it, but, but I think people who are, who are highly intuitive, uh, who go through life, um, um, these are often psychics and, you know, people who, you know, or they don't need to have a rational reason to do something. I think th those people are, I, no way of proving this, but, you know, I, I suspect that those people are probably going to be more su successful, <laughs> generally speaking. Um, uh, I know there have been studies about like, you know, successful CEOs and stuff like that, that, you know, they, these guys are often, uh, you know, are, are, you know, really interested in psychic phenomena and stuff like that, because they know <laughs> that there's, you know, that, that the, the rational um, side, you know, that is so celebrated now in psychology, you know, the system one, system two stuff, um, you know, no, it's, it's all about the unconscious and all about intuition. So, so uh, I, I, and I'm sure that doing things like precognitive dream work and so on helps train that and, and helps, helps you be more intuitive. So in that sense, I, you know, that is a kind of a superpower that, that we all can, can utilize. Um, uh, so, so that is one benefit. I'm going to give you a chance to uh, change your past right now. Um, if you could travel back in time and share a piece of advice with teenager Eric, what would it be? Hmm. Oh, I felt like it was, I felt like I had to ask you this question. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, embrace, embrace the weird, embrace the weird shit that you're interested in as a teenager, because that stuff, that's what's really important and you know your everything in your in your i don't know education and then your work life and so on will kind of try to retrain you uh to get interested in in 
boring grown up adult stuff. But honestly, my own the best thing that's happened in my own life path was returning to all the the stuff that I cared about as a teen and preteen. Honestly, you know, like um, you know, science fiction and you know, my interests right now. I've I've managed to 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 uh, create this kind of a second career as a paranormal writer. But it's basically, I'm like I'm dealing with real science fiction here. I mean, I'm dealing with the stuff of the of the sci-fi paperbacks you know of my youth and uh and it's real it's real stuff it's this is this is a real reality you know and it's been awesome to uh to realize the reality of 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 the stuff that you know the you know the childish stuff that i was you know into as a as a teen you know um and then this is you know, I, I know other people who study the paranormal uh you know the the people who are kind of brave or lucky enough to be able to study it openly um say the same thing you know like my friend uh, jeff kripal at rice university has been a you know very influential writer about the paranormal um and you know he's you know for him it's just like this big return to the comic books that he read as a youth because like basically he's studying the real life you know comic book adventures of superheroes essentially super super people you know um and that's what paranormal phenomena and psychic phenomena are uh and uh so yeah it's like like i've i've come for full circle and i wish i'd i you know it would be it would have been great to do that sooner to like not uh spend so many years thinking oh that was child stuff to put away in a box or whatever you know that's that's real that's where reality is is the is the is the stuff that whatever you're interested in at age 10 especially you know that's stick with that yeah i, I love that advice embrace the weird and mm -hmm. um yeah I, I feel like we a lot of us go through that i know i go through that yeah. like, oh, this is what's important or this is what society says you have to do or this is what will pay the, the pay the bills and so on and so forth yeah. and then it kind of makes you shut down to those, that right. unique, that weirdness that we, we all, that's intrinsic to all of us. Right. So I really like that piece of advice. Um, I guess this is one more question that I had. Besides for your own, um, what books do you recommend most often uh, to, to people? Is there like one book or, or thinker or author or something that really like impacted you or something that you really like to share with others? Yeah, well, I just mentioned Jeff Kripal. Jeffrey Kripal's books are, I don't know if you know his his work, but but he's he's done the most important work in the last over the last little over a decade, kind of legitimizing the paranormal uh as a as a serious topic for academics. Was that the was that the guy at the beginning with the study, the study you mentioned? No, that was Daryl Bem. That's a that's a science journal article. It's not, you know, it's um no, no. Uh Jeff Kripal's books, Mutants and Mystics, is uh I think I I like that of all his books the best, but all of his books are amazing. And they're about, you know, real paranormal phenomena have it happening to real people. Um, and that that book happens to be about science fiction writers and comic book artists and the sort of paranormal experiences that shape them. Um, it's you know it's it's yeah it's it's mind blowing and wonderful and he's just a great writer. Um, uh, I uh, yeah he's his his stuff is 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 what I'd, I'd recommend most and his books Authors of the Impossible is another one um, which is great but i mean there's a lot of people i could i could recommend you know it's like on on the ufo topic uh jacques valet um you know he's he's probably the one who got me really got me interested in in psychic phenomena because he was writing about ufos but 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 making the connection between ufos and psychic experiences which experiencers of ufos um especially up close uh inevitably report psychic phenomena surrounding them including precognition and that that opened my mind a lot uh his his book uh the invisible college is my favorite of his books but all of his books are great i get yeah i, I got one more question because i, I kind of wanted <laughs> to ask i wanted to ask you this earlier um how do you understand the mind is the mind just a, a epi, like, is consciousness in the mind ep, like something that arises out of the brain or how do you understand the mind? You know, I don't, I don't, I, and I'm not, honestly, I'm not interested. I, I'm really not interested in mm. these questions of consciousness. 
you know, it's like every, first of all, we don't even know what we mean by consciousness. Like two, you know, any two people think they, 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 they have a definition, but it's not going to be the same as your definition or his, you know, you got, got everyone like using different definitions of this word. Uh, and then, and then s trying to explain it. Um, I mean, I'm interested, I'm interested in the research on consciousness and, and stuff. I'm interested in the scientific research. I'm interested in, in, you know, people in the paranormal world, you know, bringing a non-material understanding of consciousness or, you know, like philosophers, you know, there's all kinds of different approaches, but given the fact that we don't, you know, even have an agreement, um, I just don't, I, I, I'm, I'm not interested. For, for one thing, precognition is totally an unconscious phenomenon. Here again, this is why I'm, I'm so interested in Freud and the psychoanalytic tradition, because that was mapping this dimension of mind that is not something we directly experience. We only indirectly experience it. So that right there takes it out of the realm of consciousness, at least in a reduced sense. Uh, so I'm, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really super interested in consciousness. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm kind of alone there because consciousness is the big kind of catch term now in the study of paranormal phenomena and uh, certainly in the new age and, and so on. Um, but I, I, it's, it's another term like free will that's like, you know, I just don't think it's helpful. And uh, my intuition is just to set it aside and, and you know, I, I get along fine in my day without thinking about consciousness. <laughs> as far as the mind, I mean, you know, I, I think that's a better term, honestly. It's, it's more vague, it's more nebulous, and it's, you know, it, it doesn't pretend to be not nebulous. That's why I like it. You know, it's kind of a philosophically discredited term and I like those you know I like those those old philosophically discredited terms because they're often you know really the most useful and um uh as far as but how do I understand the mind I mean I I, I think Freud's metapsychology I don't that and by that I mean that kind of we've all seen that iceberg model you know where you have you know the conscious ego and then you have the you know the pre-conscious and the unconscious below the surface of the water I think that's very useful I mean I think that uh uh you know, it's it's mind blowing to go back to Freud's writings. You know, they're obviously they're dated, but like push through that datedness, and like it's 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 incredibly you know that will that's a life changing experience to be exposed to psychoanalytic writing and and Freud's writing. It's 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 brilliant, and it will teach you uh, all kinds of mental tools for examining yourself. You know, even if Freud, some of Freud's presumptions were wrong, uh, his his general approach is is dead on, I think. And we've kind of lost that. You know, they, he, he got he got discredited at some point you know, because people were reducing him to the sex stuff or to the um, uh, whatever, you know, and or his views on women or whatever. And, and uh, you know, but but, you know, there's a there's a. Um, I don't know, there's a there's a, a, a tr truth to 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 a lot of the stuff that he 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 said about the just about the relationship between conscious and unconscious and i think that focusing on that is really important and very valuable this is one more thing i wanted to ask you because for some reason this uh this person just kept coming up the, as we were speaking have you are you familiar with bernardo castro's work yeah a bit yeah i've read I, i've read a few of his books yeah or his earlier stuff yeah, yeah. um He's one of these uh, thinkers, he's very articulate, very good writer, um, who sort of centralizes consciousness. And um, uh, I, again, I might, you know, I'm not so interested in consciousness. And I'm not, I guess when people seem super confident that, that it's all about consciousness and that the materialist sciences have just, you know, are just, I mean, he's, I, I sort of see him as one of these people who are sort of vilifying, you know, materialism, scientific materialism in a, in a, I think an exaggerated and unfair hmm. uh, way. I, but, but I mean, he's, he's a really good writer. I mean, I, I recommend, you know, I, I'm blanking on the names of the books. Uh, Why materialism is baloney. That's his, that's well, his yeah, popular okay. one. So, so yeah, I got a problem with that, <laughs> but, ah. but, uh, 
but I um, see why I see why we were clashing a little bit because yeah. I, I feel like I I kind of agree with a lot of the things that he was saying and and that's why I brought up his name because yeah. he he could explain the that thinking way better than I can I can't <laughs> I can't even conceptualize it how he can but a lot of that stuff kind of but I really I appreciate that you know you have your opinion and that we can disagree and have um, you know this kind of a conversation. Um, Okay, here's uh, if we have time. I mean, here's yeah, here's kind of sure. my my objection is is you know materialism is just a word. I mean, it's just it's just a word for a discourse. Okay, I'm a kind of a 1990s post structuralist, you know, basically, <laughs> and you know, it's a that's these are these are all language games we're playing. I mean, they're 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 words, and words are you know they're material phenomena and. Uh, and they don't, you know, stand, I mean, they, they stand for ideas, but there's, uh, materialism is a term, really, when it boils right down to it, you know, all you're saying when you're a materialist is that you're accepting kind of the language of the sciences, uh, you know, for how we describe, you know, what we call physical reality. Um, and, you know, you can say that you're an idealist, but you're not going to get very far, you know, making an iPhone or <laughs> sending a rocket, you know, into space, you know, using the language of Hegel, you know, <laughs> or, or, you know, or even your favorite, you know, favorite Zen writer or whatever. I mean, that's good for certain things, but it's not good for, uh, for building, building an, an expanding understanding of the natural world. Okay. And that's all we mean by materialism is, is that language. Um, that kind of set that set of that vocabulary, you know, really of of how to characterize causation in and uh, I'm interested in causation. You know, I'm interested in ca causation and its its anomalous forms, you know, like retro causation, which seem to be character characteristic of specific circumstances, like quantum computers and other circumstances where you have certain things happening on the on the atomic. Or particle level, uh, and so that's and you need that you need that that material language to understand that stuff, um, uh, and it's fine to take an an idealistic pers perspective, but but you know this the idea that somehow um, we... materialism is is a complete falsification of reality or whatever is like I, I disagree i mean materialism is constantly ideally is constantly changing the problems we see with science nowadays are institutional problems and and uh that that prevent paradigm shifts from from happening there needs to be a paradigm shift there needs to be you know an expanded understanding uh and you can call that expanded understanding something different from materialism or you can just use the same term we've been using but just have a, a new uh understanding of it and i guess that's what i where i see myself falling but but no but but that is all that said castro is a, a very interesting writer and um uh, a lot of stuff he says i agree with i mean he's he's yeah he's good yeah i i guess i'm a little at at my edge with with this subject of materialism and there's you know he 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 does justice to it i believe but I, I, I guess the one thing that I can say in response to what you were saying is that how important language is for our understanding of reality. And, and it's, it's useful to have this language of materialism and to have this language of science and ha have this ability yeah. to put things in a laboratory and look at them. I think, the, I think that what he speaks about and, and some of the other people that are kind of speaking against materialism is that we get embedded in that language and then we can't step outside of it. And then our reality becomes you know that laboratory mm -hmm. instead yeah, of the that's absolutely yeah absolutely but my experience now my, his experience i know he's a scientist and you know i uh you know i think he's working with physicists i'm you know i my experience with neuroscientists is that they're not that narrow um like i said they're able to bracket you know the the science that they do and they're not going around like trying to reduce everything to the brain or, or whatever. I mean, they, you know, I know scientists who visit psychics and have spiritual <laughs> beliefs like anybody else, you know, it's not. I, I in think private, in private. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. That's the problem. All right. That's the, that's the problem. The inability, sorry, this, uh, to, to talk about this stuff, you know, yeah, that's a, that's a problem, but it's not a problem of, of, of scientific gatekeepers. I mean, it's the, the pro, you know, look, 
visit a humanities department. It's worse in the humanities, honestly, uh, this kind of reductive kind of, uh, you know, the, the kind of bad materialist materialism in this bad guy sense is, you know, really, you know, really prevails across university. So it's like, it's not just a scientific uh, science problem. And again, it, it goes to me, it's, it's, it's more of an institutional kind of thing. I mean, this is about this is about people with power and people in, in institutions that like to be, you know, to preserve a certain, you know, worldview for various, for various reasons. Um, uh, it's, it's, I, I don't, you know, see the problem as science per se, as a, as a, as a methodology, and as a vocabulary. Um, it's, uh, you know, there, there are lots of problems with science and it's inflexible in all kinds of ways that it shouldn't be, but that's not, I don't see that the problem being materialism uh, per se, but yeah, this is a debate that we could yeah. have. We yeah. could have for hours. Fair <laughs> for enough, days, but years. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I appreciate it though. I, I definitely appreciate uh, this part of the conversation, and um, yeah, it's it's been a beautiful exploration. Uh, there was definitely times where I was at my edge, and um, I think I, I love being in that kind of place, and I'm sure that. For anybody I was listening, they would find that a lot of this conversation is mind expanding and they could check out your book, Precognitive Dreamwork. And I haven't read Time Loops, but I'm sure it speaks on similar topics. Um, yeah, where, what is the best place for people to connect with you? And, um, you know, what, what are you working on next? What's going on for you? Yeah. Uh, so my blog is the nightshirt.com. It's all one word, the nightshirt. Um, I I have a lot of stuff on the blog on this and related topics. Um, I haven't had I have had no time in the past year to really contribute to it, but there's you know it's not really timely stuff anyway. So there's a lot of, a lot of content on there, and uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, so at the night shirt is my Twitter handle. And um, actually, if they want to, if people want to contact me, that's the best way. Just DM me on Twitter, um, uh, and my email is in my new book uh for people who you know uh you know ha have you know i'd like to hear people's responses you know doing the you know uh doing what i recommend in the book and i'd, I'd love to hear your success stories <laughs> or failure stories but i've heard a lot of success stories yeah, awesome well eric i really appreciate you for coming on the show and uh sharing your experience and for doing the work that you're doing uh because it's it's definitely this kind of like more esoteric thing that a lot of people are not willing to explore and talk about. And I like that you're bringing also the science background and, uh, and merging that with in, in this exploration of dreams. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you. All right. Take care, Eric. Take care.